Hello, everybody, and welcome to another session with Microsoft Reactor. Today, we've got quite a fun one. It's probably one of my favorite ones. It's Learn Go with Liam. Now, those of you who know me, those uh, sort of met me or spoken to me before, you'll know that I love Go, I write Go. And I thought, you know what, heck with it, let's do an introduction series on Golang. Now, before we get going, I just want to say, please take a moment to read our code of conduct. It's really important that you do. Um, I really want everyone to be friendly. This is a learning environment for everybody. So please be kind, please be respectful, ask some great questions. Uh, the chat is always open for that one. And because I can't really see the chat as I'm presenting, uh, I will either rely on my co part Ralph, who's in the background, or I will pick them up at the end. Okay, so agenda time. What's on the agenda? As you can see, if you've ever watched any of my streams before, they're usually pretty slim. Uh, this one, we're gonna pack in quite a bit of stuff. So it's gonna be a lot of me talking. Now, I don't want you to think this is gonna be a full stream of me coding because it's not, but like, I don't want you to, to think that. There's three other episodes where I'm gonna be getting into a lot of the code. So of course, I'm gonna do a little bit later. I'm gonna show you how you create like a Hello World program and whatnot, but please don't think it's all that. It's going to be a lot of theory, a lot of understanding, a lot of how we got to where we are today with. Go. So what are we going to talk about? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, who I am, what I do, where I came from, the history of Go. So where it all started, the humble beginnings of such a great language, design objectives, some key features. I'm going to talk a little bit about Go versus different languages. Now, I'm not going to language bash, right? I'm not about that. But what I will do is I'm going to show some comparisons and sort of help you understand why we have Go and where and why you might choose it. Then we're gonna talk about where it's used. Some of you may or may not be surprised with some of the use cases of Go already. That's out in the wild. Gonna talk about my journey, how I really got into learning Go, why I learned it and how I sort of came to love it so much. Package management, because that's super important, especially in a language like this. Talk about a little bit why later on, but um, it's a fun story and it's, um, it's a little bit patchy. It's, not, it's probably not what you think. I'm going to talk about some numbers. So we're going to look at Stack Overflow 2022 developer survey. Really important because I show some comparisons and some pretty useful facts and figures. I noticed a couple of you have already messaged where you're from. I saw somebody from the United States. So that's going to be an interesting one because the figures are in USD, so US dollars. And then we're going to look at how we get set up. So I'm not going to do a live demo of setting up because one, it takes time. And two, I've been in demos before where I have tried to do this and it has gone horribly wrong straight from the get-go. So I've got a recording for that one, but then I'm gonna show you how to create a Hello World program and some other little things, some useful resources, where to go, how to get there, and what to use. Now, I've got a couple of notes for my demo later. So I don't know if you all saw one of my previous live streams, but my demo all went kaput. So I'm gonna see if I can follow them pretty well this time. So who am I? Okay, so my name's Liam Hampton. I'm the Microsoft Regional Cloud Advocate based in London in the UK, and I work really, really closely with the Microsoft Reactor team. So I'm always on a lot of live streams. I do a lot of public speaking. I go to conferences and whatnot, but I, I'm based on the Microsoft Reactor. I'm an author ambassador. So I think about everything security first, super important to me, you know, privilege of, uh, principle of least privilege, things like that. Absolutely love it. I'm a Go and Node.js software engineer. So I like to bat from both sides when it comes to uh, these kind of programming languages, it's quite fun. So. I get along with them, I, I compare them. I've done a lot of engineering in both courts. I'm an IoT enthusiast, and this is where Go kind of feeds into it a little bit. Uh, and this is where I really have a strong passion for Go, uh, especially on embedded boards like Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, so forth. And finally, the cliche, I love to travel. Um, it's part of the reason why I became an advocate. I love traveling, I love going all around the world, speaking at conferences, meeting new people, and creating a community. So if you ever looked at or been on any of my live streams or sessions in person and whatnot, I always have two learning goals. Now, today's learning goals are to understand the basic features of Go. That's a given. And number two is to understand how Go is being used. Now, you can interpret that how you like, whether it is understanding projects that are using Go or how you can personally use it to solve some of your projects. You take that. I'm going to leave it there. But I want you to take one thing away from this session today. And of course, everything I do is free. I'm not gonna to be touching Microsoft Azure today. So we're not gonna be doing any cloud computing. It's purely gonna be locally and through the go.dev website. So everything is free. You can go on there yourself and have a play. 
And if you're a student, you can sign up for an Azure account if you wish to, because we will be using Azure later on in the series. So it'll be good to get prepared. But if you're a student, use aka.ms forward slash A4S, and that will give you a trial account as a student. And if you're a professional or otherwise somebody who is not a student, use azure.microsoft.com forward slash free. You'll get a trial account where I think it's like $200, I think, uh, to use over 30 days. So enough for you to play with a bunch of services and spin some cool things up just as long as you take them down at the end of the 30 days. So what have I got planned for you? Okay, so this is the first of a four-part series. Now, I've already kind of outlined the first one. I want to go through a lot of theory, a lot of under sort of pinning foundations so you can understand where we're going to be moving forward to in the next three episodes. So today, we're going to look at theory and creating a Hello World program. I'm going to show you some of the documentation, some of the useful resources that I use. I'm going to use you some, show you some good um, commands, which I use, some pretty recent commands or, or useful commands, which I get going with um, that always help me in my day-to-day -day development and like a couple of other things we're going to talk about. And then episode two, we're going to look at imports, testings, uh, so testing functions, creating a web server. So really going to be quite a steep learning curve, but I'm going to make it as simple or as easy for you to follow as possible. We're going to be working with JSON and data types in the third episode because, hey, it's a, what's the point of having all this data when you can't manipulate it, you can't move it around, and you can't play with it? So I'll be talking about JSON and data types and maybe some XML if we throw it in there as well. And episode four, we're gonna look at memory management. Now that is gonna be the pinnacle of what Go is really all about at the moment. Um, and, and one of the main purposes of why it was created. So I'm gonna take you down a rabbit hole of Go routines, channels, and pointers, and maybe throw in a few extra things um, as well. So if there's something on here which I've missed off that you really want to see, that you'd be really interested in learning or knowing about, please do throw it in the chat. It's open. I will read it and I will try and action it and fit it in because none of this is set in stone. It is all for everybody to learn. And of course, this is just me putting out what I know and how best to approach it. So if you know of something that you want to know more about, please do throw it in and I'll see what I can do in the following episodes. So let's start with the history of Go. So the original problem that Google had was it had a really intricate set of systems, or so the story goes. Okay, They had a really big monolithic code base, which was quite difficult to maintain. Um, and yeah, it just wasn't really serving a purpose. Now, this is in 2000 and well, pre-2007 kind of time, right? So we think back 15 years-ish, maybe a bit longer, and you can kind of see where we're at, hardware state, programming state. You know, it's kind of like... Google was in its boom period, where it was becoming this big tech giant at this point. It was really, really ramping up, and it was becoming hard for its coders and for its developers to maintain the internal systems. So in 2007, Rob Pike, Robert Griezmann, I believe that's how you say it, and Ken Thompson thought, bright idea, let's create a new language. So the solution needed to be efficient compilation, so have efficient compilation, have efficient execution, and ease of programming. So that is both for system side and the human side. And you know it wasn't really made for the sake of it at this point. You could always have two, but not the third one. So any, any two you can sort of mix together, but then you'd be missing out or you'd be compromising on the third at this point. So they looked around, they looked at C, C++, uh, Java, Python, et cetera. Nothing really fit the bill at that time. So they thought, let's create something. So this is when Go was created, and it's a statically typed open source language. It open sourced in November 2009, but the first release wasn't actually until March 2012. So, well, I say first release, the first stable release of version one. Now that's only 10 years ago, okay? So that's really not that long ago if you think about it in sort of like a time, timeline, right? So a lot has happened over the past decade, but in the ramp up to it sort of becoming a language, you know, there's so much that went into it. This, this stemmed from three people, and of course, they needed the help of the community. I believe it started as like a 20% project. I think that's what you get at Google, uh, all the developers, much like um, some of the other projects which come out of Google. And this was one of them. Of course, we have the mascot. This is called the gopher. Uh, it's probably why it's such a popular language with developers. You know, it's like this 21st century sort of characterized or like I have a really good verbose character behind it with a great community. It's all very playful and quite charismatic, which is quite nice. Okay. So when, when you're thinking about it, I don't know, most languages have a mascot. You've got Python's got a snake. So there's that weird 
some sort of cross. Um, Java, you've got a cup of coffee. Um, I don't know what other ones are there. There's quite a few, but then it's, they all kind of have a mascot. But this one is like a fun characterized mascot, which is quite cool. And a lot of people take the design and play with it quite a lot. So you might see a ninja, you might see, I don't know, a teacher, you might see someone like Star Wars, things like that. There's some really fun uh, mascot sort of interpretations out there, but it's really fun. You can do that. Okay, people do it and it's, it's great to see. So what are the design objectives? And before I get going, if you see me looking over here or down here or over there, it's I've got like cameras and screens everywhere. So I'm just trying to make sure which I'm trying to look at the camera as much as I can. So what are the design objectives? Well, they wanted simplicity. Okay, so they wanted a simple language with clean syntax and minimal keywords. We're going to get into the keywords part a little bit later because it's quite cool. But on the face of it, they really wanted this to be an easy language for developers to play with, for them to create and code with. They wanted scale. Now, this is all in sort of terms of what they wanted to create. These are the objectives that they wanted. So they wanted scale. Now, at system scale, they wanted greater support for concurrency. Like, yes, cool, you have Java, multi-threaded language. But they wanted something a little bit more lightweight. And they got the engineering scale, you know, the language, which is good for large code bases. So you've got the two sides of it now. You've got the system scale and you've got the developer scale, so the engineering side of it. Modern hardware, they wanted to aim to hit modern hardware. Now, it's hard to think of it thinking, you know, you know, it's been around for a couple a decade. Surely in 2007, they had great sort of hardware. But if you think about when Java and Python and C and C++ and all the other lovely languages, Pascal, they're all created prior to 2007. So they weren't really designed for modern hardware at this point. So, you know, so multi-core CPUs, networking hardware, which has just blown up exponentially over the past decade or 20 years distributed systems. So they wanted a language which was scalable, simple, and was able to run sort of really quickly on this hardware. Going forward, that's what they envisioned, Moore's Law, all of those kind of things. So they're sort of looking into the future as such at this point. Code efficiency. They wanted a language which was easy for programmers like yourself and I to code and play with. And if you, when we sort of look at some of the syntax a little bit later on and throughout this series, you'll see it's really not too dissimilar to other familiar languages, but it's got more of a, a basic approach to it, which is quite nice. You know, they wanted a language which would give you the help that you needed, but also gave you enough control to sort of balance it out either way. You got safety, okay? So two types of safety, you got type safety. So I don't know who wants errors in production, I don't. So this is when it's compiled, you'll know if there's something wrong already. So when you do go build or yada, 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 it will throw an error straight away with a compiler. So when it tries to build everything down into a package, uh, if something's wrong or if, you know, if you've got some variables out of type or you know, your type casting doesn't match or whatnot, it's going to throw an error. You know, so they wanted it to be really, really strong and sturdy. And then you've got memory safety, which kind of memory management as such, you know, it's handled gracefully and one that you can control. So as we go further, we'll talk about pointers and references and the garbage collector and things like that, which sort of were embedded within Go right from day one. And you got runtimes, you know, so they wanted an efficient, latency-free, garbage-collected environment, okay? They wanted a, a really lean runtime, which was good for developers, good for the system, and good at scale. And they also wanted a package model. And this was quite a this is quite a contention for me because if when we sort of talk about packages later on, you'll see how and why the package model really maybe didn't really work all too well to begin with. It was a good vision, right? It was a great vision. It works wonderfully now, but you know over the past decade, it's chopped and changed quite a bit. You know they wanted an easy way to keep a big code base maintainable. Yeah. You know? So what came out the other end? So when it was released, what was what did they take those design objectives with? And what did they throw out the other end of the pipe? Well, they gave us a statically typed language, which was good for security, kind of. And we're gonna talk a little bit more why I say kind of later on. Strong concurrency support, okay? So they got something which rivals Java or has the power of Java as such rather. And you're able to use Go routines and channels with interrupts. So you can pass data around, you can sort of kick off asynchronous or parallel tasks. It's not quite parallel, but it creates parallelism, 
um, and that's like a completely different rabbit hole, which I'm not going to go down. It's got a really powerful standard library, and its tool set is really, really up there with some of the best. You know, for example, you can create a HTTP server within the character limit of a tweet. That's pretty cool. You can also make some really, really big projects without having to import third-party libraries. You know, you've got pretty much everything you need straight out of the box right from the get-go. Okay. It has built-in testing capabilities, something which other languages don't have. And this is really, really fundamental when it comes to security and testing and having a really robust framework, which you can test your code with right out the box. OK, it's not the, the greatest. You can still bring in third party testing scenarios or, or frameworks, but its purpose, it serves really well straight away. And you've got the garbage collection. And I have a feeling I kind of messed up my slide there. But hey, we have a garbage collector. And this is a really smart way to manage memory. When you're sort of compiling, you don't want memory leaks. You know, you don't want anything to sort of continue sort of leaking out, or, or your memory to really start bottoming out at that point. You need to keep it all in check. But it helps you do that. So it has the power of C more C languages, but a smarter way of it, right? So in I think it's in C or C plus plus. You don't have a garbage collector, but you have the ability to sort of play with memory addresses and manipulate pointers, references, and so forth. This just does it all kind of for you kind of taken away some of that responsibility, but it's really quite smart at it. And finally, it has got cross-platform support. Now, this is probably the best and biggest part and the best part about this language is when you compile the code that you've written, it bundles it all into a lovely machine code binary, and you can choose different OSs or, or operating systems, rather, and architectures that you can build for. It's got a whole bunch of them, which I will show a bit later on. So cross-platform support is brilliant. I can build a Windows binary or .exe executable from my lovely Mac machine that I'm using today. So what do we have in Go? What, what can we play with? Okay, so we've got human readable and a really simple language. Okay, so they gave us simplicity. They gave us a really quite a developer-friendly language to play with. And I've already kind of spoiled the fun here, but we have 25 keywords. Okay, so a keyword in a language is Funk is break, default, select, case, defer, go, map, struct, and so forth, right? So these are the keywords. These are reserved words which you, can, which you can't use for anything else at this point. But there's only 25 of them, which gives you the freedom to do a lot more with a lot less. And you've got machine efficiency. So you've got compiled into machine code, so binaries, like I've already mentioned, you know? You've got no middle layer, so there's no virtual machines involved. Uh, if you think about other languages, you have different sort of attributes you need to add beforehand. You know, the memory safe mechanisms here, you've got nil references, you've got runtime bound checks, you have got default initialization of variables. So there's quite a lot that's already been packaged into a standard library straight out of the box, which kind of takes the best parts of other languages and puts them all together into one, which I absolutely adore. But then what do we not have? And now this is where people, people usually turn their nose up and it's like, ah, oh, well, actually, you don't have the fundamental beginnings of an OO program language. OK, so object oriented for those who don't know what OO is. So no subclasses. You've got no inheritance. You've got no constructors or destructors and no try catch paradigms. So thinking about error checking, maybe in JavaScript where, or Java, you have a try and a catch and you throw an error. So the error handling is a little bit mm, ski with it. I mean, it still is, but it's getting better. But the purpose of this is you are doing more with less at this point, okay? You don't necessarily need all of this to create wonderful programs. And they've done it in such an elegant way with Go, you know? So you ask yourself why you don't have it and you've got developer clarity. So it creates a really clean, clear, concise program for you to write as a developer, keep it really nice, modulized, because this is all for cloud native now, you know? We're moving forward into that, that space. And again, if you've watched Microsoft Ignite last week, our whole topic was do more with less. Well, actually, this was happening way before, uh, way, way before, years ago. Okay, so everybody wanted to do a lot more with a lot less, and Go gave you the power to do so. So let's look at some other languages. What are other languages like when it comes to comparisons? Okay, so like I said, I'm not going to do a load of language bashing. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to just merely overview okay this is really really high level i don't know these other languages well enough to really dig deep into them but i've just taken it at face value of what i do know and how it compares so with python go 
Go is statically typed. Python is dynamically typed. Go is compiled. Python is interpreted. So it's done at runtime. Whereas with Go, you build a binary and you call the binary. It's already there. It's already packaged up. You know, that gives you a little bit of safety when it comes to error checking. You know, you know you don't really have, you might have bugs, but it wouldn't say a comp compilation error at that point because you've already been able to compile your code down into your machine code, into a binary. And of course, Go has built-in support for concurrency using Go routines, channels, interrupts, etc. What about C and C++? Well, again, this is what another language they looked at when they were deciding what they wanted to do with Go. So Go has explicit dependencies. You have to explicitly import dependencies at the very, very top of your package, and it has to be there. It has to be built in. There's no circular dependency. That's not permitted in Go. So you, know, you can kind of get in some horrible loops um, while avoiding circular dependencies, but you know, it's not permitted, period. Go's got a garbage collector, whereas C and C++ doesn't. I've kind of already mentioned that, but it kind of alleviates the pain. You know, you don't really want to be messing with the memory management. You don't really want to have to deal with all of that low level sort of attributes. You want to be able to have it abstracted away and have Go do it for you. And it does. Yeah. Go has no point for arithmetic, whereas in C and C++, it does. Again, a really, really big sticky point for some developers. And let's look at Java, because this is what people tend to compare Go with. Uh, it's either Java or Rust, but I'm not going to talk about any Rust today, because that's like a forbidden word. Just a joke. Go is much less verbose, okay? So I've personally written a lot of Java code in the past, okay? And I've written hundreds and hundreds of lines of code, and I've come back to Go a few years later and thought, ah, oh, I've done this before, realized it was in Java, and was kind of like, oh, okay, so I can do this in sort of half the amount of code. So it's really, really quite simple. It has its pros and cons. If you start writing loads of code, it gets really complex, but you kind of can understand what's going on. Whereas if you write little code, you're kind of abstracting quite a lot away at this point, and you might not really understand what's going on under the hood, which is the purpose of today's sort of stream. There's no mechanism similar to the JVM in Go. So Go sits directly on the hardware. You can run the binary on your machine. You know, you can just throw it to any server and run it as long as you know it's built for that operating system or, or architecture that it's sat on. Whereas with Java, you kind of have the JVM, you've got everything, that middle layer, which it sits on. I think, you know, it's been taken away with sort of like this whole push for cloud native compute, but at least it used to be this way inclined. Go uses Go routines. Like I said, it's kind of like a lightweight thread. It's not quite in like a whole thread like Java does, um, but Java does use actual threads. So like I mentioned, it creates parallelism, not quite parallel. Again, that's just another topic. I'll probably explain maybe a little bit more as we get on to Go routines in the third or fourth episode. Go has pointers. Java does not, which means that you have a little bit more control over where your memory is and your allocations, um, albeit with the garbage collector and whatnot, but it's still there. It's available to you to play with. And Go can have multiple return values of a function. Again, this is something I'm going to show you a little bit later on, maybe in the next episode with functions, how you can return two values as opposed to just with Java, you have one. So this is kind of like a really high-level overview, but you can see where the good parts of Go are starting to pull out from different languages. And you can kind of understand in comparison as to where it sits. Now, again, you can go, oh, this just deserves an entire article or entire stream in itself. And I'm sure I could do this at some point, but not today. <laughs> So where is Go used? Now, some people will be surprised. Some people maybe not so surprised. But it came about in this whole cloud native push. So I mentioned Go version 1 came out in 2012, March 2012. Fast forward one year to 2013, and Docker arrived on the scene. Coincidence? I think not. So Docker, if you don't know what Docker is, it's all around containerization. So packaging up lovely bits of code into a small container, which can then be run anywhere. It kind of alleviates the works on my machine, doesn't work on your machine problem, because you just kind of lift and shift, and it should work. Kubernetes came along in 2014. So this was really like the catalyst at the very beginning of the cloud native push at this point now. So you've got Docker, we've got Kubernetes. So that came out in 2014, just a year later than Docker. Uh, kind of worked together, different systems, but or different software, but they work very much together. Istio, if you've ever used any microservices or network mesh, Istio is written in Go. Prometheus, if you've ever done any monitoring or any um, sort of 
Yeah, she is. It's just monitoring um, flame graphs, things like that. So if you've ever used that, then Prometheus is written in Go. Now, I don't know whether to mention this now or, or later on, but um, I'll do it now. So Go actually derived sort of from C languages. So when way back when I was working at IBM in a as a software dev, I was sort of playing around with some flame graphs with Prometheus. I was sort of analyzing the underlying uh, machine code and how it all talks to different buses and how the CPU is managing different buses and memory management. And I kind of came across Go at this point because I was monitoring and sort of sort of working through the underlyings of Go and realized a lot of it was just done through C. So I actually used a tool called Perf and Perf was a really lovely Linux tool which enabled you to monitor and see all of this lovely undergoings. But yes, you can then build from that a Prometheus flame graph and it is written in Go and it all kind of fits together in a weird kind of puzzled way. CLIs, okay, we've got kubectl. So again, if you use Kube, Kubernetes, then kubectl is also written in Go. Really powerful, powerful language for writing a CLI. And I'm gonna get onto that into my journey and how I got into it myself. You got the GitHub CLI. So if you've ever used GitHub, um, then, or rather the CLI, I don't personally use it much, but it certainly is around. I think it came around like maybe a year or two ago. Um, it really started picking up. Pretty cool CLI, but again, it's written in Golang. And of course, Terraform. So any HashiCorp, well, actually most of HashiCorp's products, I think now is you know, like uh, Vault, you've got Terraform, a whole bunch of others, but they're all written in Go. So there's so many more as well, but these are just a few high level examples, which I believe you may have seen before or used. And here's a fun fact for you. More than 75% of products in the CNCF, that's Cloud Native Computing Foundation, are actually written in Go. That's pretty cool. Considering this is a language which is only about a decade old now, you know, we're still on version, what, 1.19. You know, we haven't really come leaps and bounds. I mean, we've come pretty far, but if you take this statistic, a lot of, a lot of products are banking on this being the cloud native push. You know, it was written as a language for cloud native development. It's written for the cloud. It's written for services to be talking together as microservices and have that sort of standard interface. It's really, really, really cool to play with. And this is kind of... The numbers don't lie, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so the CNCF is, is a fantastic place. For those of you who don't know, that is just a sort of a, a collection of projects. Uh, a lot of them are open source. I, think, I actually think all of them are open source. But this is where they're sort of recognized as, um, as CNCF products. And like I said, a lot of them are written in Go. So what about my journey? How did I get into Go? How did I get into this seat today? And talking to you about a lovely language which I like to write. Well, I started off as an OGS developer at IBM, working on this lovely microservices product called Microclimate. It was wonderful, but it was all written in Node. Now, I already had a gripe with Node because of the NPM packages, the open source, kind of all of that didn't really feel great for me because we were kind of relying on a, on a corporate product at this point, um, relying on some code which someone somewhere may have written in their bedroom at three o'clock in the morning by a student or some malicious hacker, okay? So you can't always rely on it. But again, it's the same with Go, but Node and NPM just seem to have a little bit more of a gripe on me purely because of this. I was then asked to create a CLI, okay? So this product didn't really last as a corporate product. We decided to open source it. And through the open sourcing, kind of got rid of the whole UI and all of that sort of heavy weight around the product at this point. And we turned it into a VS Code plugin. And I was tasked, or I was asked to create a CLI for the driver. So when you click something on the plugin, it would then call the CLI, which would be running underneath, you know, an event-driven architecture as such, if that's what you want to call it. And I was able to go away and research it. I literally Googled how to make a CLI. That, that no, no word of a lie. I went into Google and I saw that. And I saw Python, C, and Go. And Go is like this hot language at the time. This is back in 2018 or 2019. And this is when like version 1.9-ish was around. Um, and that's actually pretty fundamental when we get onto the next step because I'll show you what happened after 1.9. So as such, as it open sourced, I became a maintainer of this project. And I just kept plugging in, like plugging in. And it's that old cliche, right? I never learned Go. I never knew Go. I was literally learning as I was building. And this was like an open source project. So we had lots of people outside sort of commenting on it and reviewing the code and sort of having a look and putting code in. And oh, it's brilliant. 
But the old cliche of, you know, what's it called? Building the plane while flying. That's kind of what I was doing at this point. And I was pretty young. I was only been in sort of like professional dev or graduate dev like a year or two at this point. And I was already sort of kicking off. So I'd used Node, put that to a side, really fell in love with Go. And of course, I never looked back, evidently, because I'm still talking about it today. I still write Go today. So what are some of the important milestones in the language history? So I mentioned, you know, in 2018, 19-ish, it was version 1.9. Okay, so a couple iterations later, 1.11, Go modules became the major package manager. We're going to talk about package management next because it's a really important part of this stream or, or understanding of where Go came from. And then the second milestone is version 1.18, generics previewed. Generics came into Go at 1.18, and that was earlier this year, late last year, I can't remember where we are now, we're in October. It was around this time, uh, about a year ago. Now, Go was already a bit of Marmite with certain developers because you had a lot of the power of OO pro programming, object oriented programming, but you necessarily didn't have all the, sort of the attributes that go along with that, i.e. subclasses, inheritance, etc. So it was already Marmite from that perspective, but then you flip it on its head, and now you've got generics because it's so strongly typed, they decided to put generics, preview generics. Now, generics is when you can reference or pass through variables that are of any type. So you used to say, you know, this, like ABC is a string, okay? Now you can sort of say, not quite, but ABC is any, so it could be anything at this point. So you're kind of passing it through and able to manipulate it later on through the code, which is pretty, some might say it's dangerous, but you know, it has its pros and cons. I'm not really yet to use them properly because they're sort of gathering momentum as the versions go on. We're on 1.19 now, so it's pretty new still, but um, it's certainly gonna become a fundamental point or part of Go. Oh, package management, like I mentioned. Currently 1.19, but prior to version 1.5, so that's about 14 iterations away, so go backwards in time, used to use something called the Go path and Go route, which used to be a dedicated path on your system, on the actual your host laptop, where it would have subfolders. Now these subfolders would be bin, so B-I-N, you'd have a folder called SRC, so your source folder, and you'd have one called PKG. Now this was your package folder. They were deliberately split up like this so that everybody knew, everybody had the same setup and everything was pointed to the same direction in the same subfolders, in the same tree, everything was standard across the board. Wonderful. But now what if you don't have access to a machine to create those folders or manipulate them? What if you suddenly don't have the security enabled um, for yourself or the policies and the access rights to do that? Uh, then you've got a big problem. So it moved on. But it was really, really tightly coupled with GitHub at this point. And like I said, painful to manipulate and maintain. So what do they do? Well, they created a vendor folder experiment. So version 1.5 onwards, so like six, seven, eight, et cetera, they had the vendor folder. Now the vendor folder was kind of like an abstraction away from the Go path and Go routes. And whenever a program or an import or a dependency was imported, it would be put into the vendor folder first. So when it's called, when, when it sort of looks for the dependency in your code, it would always go there before going to the path and the route. So it's like just a layer of abstraction before it gets to the defined or previous path. And this is when it all broke loose because you had something called Glide and we had something called Depth. And this is where I came into Go. This is where I started learning it. And Glide and Depth were package managers. They're third party package managers, should we say. And they did an okay job, but it was still pretty painful because if you had a project using Glide and you're used to using Depth, well, then you've got a bit of a mismatch of skills and how the projects run. Likewise, if you're, you know, if you're using Glide and not Depth or, or whatever, it became a problem. And it was such a problem that only a few versions later, they released modules, Go modules in 1.11. And this became the standardized package manager or packaging for Go. It used go.sum and go.modfiles to house within your current work directory, the different versions of dependencies that you're using and the link to where it's off to on GitHub. Um, like I said, it's all really tightly coupled with Git. Uh, sorry, GitHub, not Git. But this was completely detached from the Go path, which now means that you can create your 
your project anywhere on your machine and you can still run the Go code there. Okay, it doesn't need to be in your Go path anymore. You don't need to have your Go sort of your, your language installation binary or whatever installed on Go path, Go root. It just needs to know where it is roughly on the machine to then go out and call. You know, it's completely detached from one another. So this was part of the compiler chain. And Go mod is only necessary for the build. Okay, so I'm going to show you this in a little bit when we create a Hello World program, but Go mod is only necessary for building it because that houses the dependencies and Go sum is used for caching. So for really big projects, this can be quite fun to play with and see because uh, your sum just ends up like that long because you end up building it quite a lot and caching quite a lot. So obviously you need to manipulate what goes on and, and understand the caching policies behind it. But for now, we don't need to worry. It's just good to know about it and good to know what it's for. So here are some certain roles which I see Go used in. Now, by no means, this is just an observation of myself. This is just something which I've noticed as an engineer, as somebody talking to a lot of people and networking throughout the community. But Go is extremely prevalent in DevOps engineering. It is really, really extremely prevalent in SRE, so site reliability engineering, and software engineering. So a lot of software engineers who are working with cloud native products, open source projects, it's really, really heavy in those aspects there. Like I said, by no means extensive, by no means definite. This is just an observation from myself. And here are some numbers. Now, I find this absolutely fascinating, these numbers, because I always look at the Stack Overflow survey every single year to compare where Go is. Now, on the left-hand side, we've got commonly used languages in profession. And Go is 11%, right? So it's about 11 point fifteen percent, which is kind of up there. You know, it's, it's not as much as Java, Python, JavaScript, etc., but it's still very much there. And I feel that's only going to grow year on year. On the flip side, on the right side, you've got Go loved versus hated, or what does it say? Dreaded, sorry. So love versus dreaded. Now, there's a lot more love than there is for dread. Now, still kind of trying to battle this because it's a very much a Marmite language that people are still yet to get to grips with. It's still a quite a unique language to play with, but it's nice to know the community love it. And this is of a respondent of about 71,000. I think that's pretty like average for what they get every year. And then at the top, for those of you who are watching in the States, well, this one is for you because this is the median salary for somebody in 2021, $75,000. And in 2022, that has jumped quite a bit to almost $90,000, okay? So it's going up. It's going up quite significantly. Obviously, there's going to be other attributes to this, current economic, economic climate, et cetera, but it's still very much a growing language and a growing profession, and people and more companies are after it. Now, whenever I see job adverts uh, on LinkedIn or whatever, um, or if ever I'm approached by people, it's more often than not, they've got go in the description or go slash Java slash Rust slash a whole bunch of other things. But Go is always there. Like it's a prevalent language now. So that's what we need to keep in mind. So let's look at some useful commands. Okay, so if you are typing Go, so once you've installed it and you type in Go, what do you get? Well, this is the Go CLI, which allows you to do all the fun things on your system with Go. So we've got bug, build, clean, doc, env, fix, FMT, which is format for those of you who don't know, and a whole bunch of others, right? But there's only a couple which only really make sense and mean something to us, okay? Well, at least to me. So I use build, clean, doc, and I use go get and go install. Now, what do they do? So build packages everything up for you. It creates a binary in your current directory, okay? You've got clean. It removes object files and cache files. So this is where it kind of starts clearing up your directory if you've got like a whole bunch of junk. It's just like clearing your browser history at this point or cache and cookies and stuff, right? So that just cleans it all out. And doc is a really, really cool one because you can search for any document or any, any documentation on the doc's website through the CLI, which is really cool. I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. Go get goes off and gets packages. For you so you may or may not have seen go get uh, hyphen u and then like a github link it goes and gets it pulls it into your your modules and obviously go install if you to create a binary and you want to install your program on your machine you can do go install and this will just um, this will install on your machine so you don't have to do go run blah 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 you can just do 
dot slash your binary or your exe or whatever you've got going, right? So those are some really, really cool commands and useful ones which I use. So let's get set up. We're kind of tailing off. I did say there was a lot of theory to go through, but I wanted to give you a good foundation and understanding and some of the semantics and mechanics behind Go um, to begin with. So like I said, here's a video. It's like a two minute video. I'll talk you through what I'm doing. Um, so what I've done is I have gone to go.dev. Now this is the website for Go, and I'll show you this in a minute. I'll have a little walk through with you. As you can see, some of the partners, some of the companies that use it, you've got some quick start guides, really, really useful, but I'm just gonna download it. Now I'm downloading it. You can download it with Brew if you like, if you've got a different package manager. I think uh, Chocolate, I think if, is another one I've heard of, uh, I think on Windows, uh, but you can certainly do this through the website. You've got different versions. Uh, you've got tier, was it um, tar.gz, you've got uh, the source code, you've got a whole bunch of things, right? But I'm using the ARM64, the new M1 Mac. So I'm going to download this binary here. So once I click on this one, should have sped this up a bit more, but uh, I'll download it here. And then you see at the bottom left, it's downloading. Once that's finished downloading, I'm just going to double click and install it. It's just a DMG for me. Um, oh, it's a .pkg, it's a package. Yes, I've already got it installed, but I deliberately waited for this stream to update because I had 1.18 installed. I now want 1.19. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and install it. And I'm just going to say, yes, yeah, sure thing. It's going to do its little jazz. I sped this up quite a lot, but I still needed to speed it up a bit more. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it takes a minute to install, which why I didn't do this live. Um, I think it took me like maybe five minutes just to get it all down and packaged up. Now this would be the same whether you have it pre-installed or not. So if you already had Go on your system and you go and do this, you'd be following the same steps as I am. And likewise, if you didn't have Go on your system, uh, then you just do exactly the same steps. So as you can see, I've moved it to my bin and I can now go ahead and open a terminal, type in Go version and it will tell me, oh look, you've just downloaded and it's installed and is running 1.19. Dot two, which is the latest version of Go. So what next? Okay, so we're gonna write our first Hello World program. There's a few things I'm gonna do prior to that. Uh, so what do we need for that? We need Go, so tick, we've installed Go. We need VS Code, so anybody who is new to development, VS Code is a really cool code editor, which you can use. Um, Stack Overflow set is the most popular, absolutely not biased at all. Uh, you also need the Go VS Code plugin, so from the tools, which I'll also show you on the marketplace, it was, I think it began creation of Microsoft, but then ended up being taken over by Google at some point, I believe. Um, <clears throat> but that's a really cool plugin. It's really, really useful. There's so many things. You've got the format, you've got vetting. Um, I think it's part, you've got testing. It helps with the testing framework and all sorts. We will get into this later in the, uh, in the session, in, in the series. Okay, so now I will jump out and I will do some coding. So... Let's quickly go and stream it out. So bear with me if we have any questions so far. So let me just stop sharing this screen because I don't need this one. I need my actual laptop. Do we have any good questions? Okay, so what to cover? Golang fundamentals, create a web server, data type, JSON, Go routines, pointer channels, basically memory management. Yes, uh, it is basically memory management because that is one of the main parts of Go. So yes and no. Uh, there's a lot more to it than memory management because Go is a really powerful language. When it comes to web servers, okay, you have a lot of routing that can be done. You have got a lot of under sort of under the hood semantics that go on when you're playing with it. So yes, memory management, but also no, you can get away with not touching pointers. You can get away with not touching references and so forth. Um, I think I didn't even touch any of that until sort of two, three months into my learning journey on Go. Uh, same with Go routines. I, it took me about a year until I even needed to use one properly. Of course, there were places where I should have used it and I didn't. But to understand it is quite, you know, it's quite difficult. So like I said, I'm going to try and make it as best as I can. So let me get up my other screen. So let me get this one up. Now let's move StreamYard over. And let's minimize my slides. What else do we have? Okay. So... The first thing that I want to do, so let me throw, oh, am I not showing my screen? Is my screen up? There we go. All right, so everyone can see my lovely, um, my lovely messy desktop. So let's go new window. Okay, so what do we want to do? So let's go to the Go Dev website. So go.dev. 
this is the website which I showed earlier, and this was in the video. And what this is doing, this is like a really, really compact website where you have everything that you need. So some of the companies that use Go, you've obviously got Google, Meta, Microsoft, a whole bunch of us, right? So all the big tech uh, using it. And here we've got the Go Playground, which I'm going to be showing you shortly. You've got some quick started guides down at the bottom. Uh, so you can get going with DevOps site reliability, etc. You've got web development, so different IDs that you can use. You've got the net HTTP package, which is one which I love. Um, there are, of course, other packages you can use, but there is so much covered already in the standard package. It's pretty darn cool to play with. What else we got? Let, we've got some really cool CLI commands as well. So I've just got something. Move this one out of the way. Let me show you some CLI commands that we are going to use. So we need... So if I want to show you the distribution list of Go, so if you're using, you know, I'm using a Mac at the moment, like we, saw, like we just saw. If you're using a Windows, then there's a command you can use. So let's go to dist list. Really, really quite a funky one. Uh, but that's the Go tool distribution list. And that will outline every single distribution that you can build a binary for, which I think is pretty cool, right? So what else do we have? We have got the documentation command next. So if you want to be building for Linux, you can build for Linux. You can build, I don't know, Plan 9. I think there's Android on here somewhere. Somewhere. Yep, there we go, Android. I mean, I don't know why you would, but you can. Um, another really cool one to look at is actually, I might make that a bit bigger for you. So let's create that a bit bigger. This one you're going to probably want to read. So let's do go uh, doc FMT. Now, FMT is a format package where you'd use print lines and strings and so forth. Are you ready for this? So online, we have got the documentation through the website, which I'm going to show you. But you can also see in your terminal, you can read all of the lovely documentation for Go FMT. And likewise, you can do this for all the different packages if you want to. But I use this because it's quite a quick, easy way to sort of get hold of documentation uh, with Go. And it reaches straight out to your uh, the website. So over here, if we look uh, here, we've got packages. This is where it reaches to. And you can search for a package on the website as well. So if I want to search for FMT, I can search for FMT. It's in the standard library, which is sort of outlines for you what's already in the standard library and what's not with these lovely labels. And I can go ahead and read it. The same with third party packages as well. If I want to search for a third party package, one that I use fairly often is Grillamux, which is a networking package. And this is just help with routes and um, sort of your request, get requests, post requests, et cetera, for a web server. And of course, you can read this. And this is also on GitHub, by the way. So this readme is the same readme that's on GitHub. It's just pulled into this website. There's like a whole copy of it. And then you can also access it through the CLI as well. OK, so hopefully that is like some pretty interesting facts and some stuff that you can do with, uh, with packages and understanding where to go and how to search for some first party and third party packages with Go. And of course, I'm only showing you this very briefly because not just because of time, but also because going forward, I'm actually going to be using these in the stream. So I'm going to be showing you how I actually work my way through a problem or how I would approach something and read it and interpret it. And the documentation is super, super powerful for Go. It's one thing which I adore. It's one of the main things which I use um, and I find it really, really helpful. So. What's next? Let's go and open a let's go and open a code window. So let's clear this. Let's go and open VS Code. So where are we? So I'm on my home screen. I'm going to go. So I'm pretty old school. I still have the old sort of file structure where you'd have go and then you'd have bin package source. So I go into source. I would then also go into GitHub because it is so tightly coupled with GitHub. This is how you have like local packages. We're going to get into this in like episode two, I think. Um, so we're going to go into GitHub and then I'm going to go into this where I have all of my projects, learn go with Liam. And we've got absolutely nothing in this directory already, but I'm going to open it up in VS Code, he says. So that's now open. As you see, I've got nothing in here at all. But the one thing which I want to show you straight off the bat is the marketplace plugin for Go, which I mentioned. So if I want to type in, go to the extensions on the left-hand side, type in Go, and you will get this lovely list of everybody who's tried to create some package for it, whether it's I don't know, tidying, testing framework, pointers, or sorry, uh, debugging, et cetera, 
they're all there. But this one is the most important one. This is the official one that's made by the Go team at Google. Uh, I believe it started at Microsoft, I think, maybe. Um, and it outlines everything that you need in Go. So you have the Go PLS, you've got the DLV, you've got everything that you need when it comes to writing Go to help you with the creation of Go code. So whether you're missing an import, it will tell you, it will underline squiggly line, it will automatically create imports for you. So I'm going to show you in a minute how it automatically imports the FMT package when I create a hello world package or, or sort of bit of code. So that's the one plugin which I'd advise you download and install if you're watching this one. So let's actually go ahead and create a hello world because we've only got nine minutes left and I want to get this done and answer some questions as well. So I'm going to create a new package, uh, sorry, a new, a new file. I'm going to call it main.go because that is what most folders have. We'll talk about file structure and project directories in the next one when we create a web server because it's a little bit more verbose. But as you can see straight off the bat, the plugin is telling me, hey, you've got a red line, sort it out. So you always start with a package at the top and this is how you interpret different packages of code across your code base. So like I said, there's no classes or inheritance, but there are packages and you've got global functions and local functions. So we've got package main. Now at this point, I would usually do my import for FMT, but I'm gonna try it without, and I haven't done this today, but I will try and see what happens. So I'm gonna do func main, and then I'm going to do FMT dot print line. So it, this is the format, this is the plugin automatically helping me. So I'm gonna do print line and I'm going to say, hello, gophers. So hello, everybody. Now, hopefully, as you saw, it automatically imported the import FMT for me. And I can just save that one. And I can go and run that. So I'm going to create a terminal in VS Code. I'm going to do go run main.go. Hello, gophers. All right, so that's a really basic program that I've just spat out. Cool. What next? Well, I mentioned something about binaries. You know, this whole cross compilation platform sort of thing earlier, right? So if I do go build, uh, it's gonna error because you need modules. Okay, so now I need to do go mod init. As you can see on the left-hand side, I have now got a go mod file over here. Obviously there's not a lot in it, but the module is learn go with Liam. I'm using go version 1.19, which you can see in the bottom left of my corner if you just about squint. And now, if I save that, I should be able to do a go build. Cool. And now it's created this lovely file on the left-hand side, which is a binary. So now, instead of doing go run and getting it to sort of ad hoc compile my code straight off the bat, I can now do dot slash learn go with Liam and enter that. That's a binary. That is machine code. Now, I can do this for different systems. All I do is, do is specify the extension. And you can change the name of the binary. You can change all sorts of things at this point. So this is a really basic way of getting into Go. Now, you may say, well, oh, that's really quite a lot of effort to do that locally. Well, fear not people, because we have another method. We can go to the website for Go. And if we click on, let's actually go to Go Playground. It's a really, really fun place online where you can go to throw your code and do some debugging. Well, hello there. What is this? This is a browser terminal. Well, I said terminal is a browser editor, right? So I can change this to say um, Microsoft Reactor. Hello, Microsoft Reactor. And let's run that and see if we get that one out. Look at that. It executed well. So we have a terminal, which means we've got a standard in and standard out. So it's taking this input. It's giving us some feedback. This is a really basic, really basic program but it's really powerful to have in a browser. Now Go Playground is fantastic. It's been around for a while. You get the option of changing your uh, version. So version 1.8, 18, sorry. Um, so I believe, I don't know why they've done that to 18, maybe the generic switch over and so forth. A lot changed when they did that. Or you got the dev branch, which is gonna be maybe their nightly build or something. Um, you can do different formattings. And on the right-hand side, you can also see you've got a whole bunch of different programs to choose from. So. Let's take a, I don't know, the Fibonacci. Where's Fibonacci? Fibonacci closure. Heck with it. Let's run it. Let's see what we get out. Look at that. One, one, two, three, five. So Fibonacci, for those of you who don't know, is always like, I think it's like adding the previous number to your current number. Um, so one plus one is two. Two plus one is three. Two, uh, three plus two is five, etc. So you got some really, really cool things that you can do online 
with Go Playground as well. So I think I have finished up this stream, but what I'm also going to do now is I'm going to open up my slides and I'm going to go through, that is not the right slides that I want. This is always good fun, right? Learn Go with Liam, this is what we want. So episode two, what are we doing next? Wait, not next week, the week after, the 9th of November. So episode two, imports, testing, functions, and creating a web server. Now, like I said, this is going to be like a pretty steep uplift, but I'm going to try and make this as simple as possible. I'm going to make sure all of these resources are available online for you to play with. I'm going to make sure that you can get in contact with me. So if you need me, you can always ping me on Twitter, on TikTok, or anything. Uh, I will try my best to reply to you if you have anything. If you're following along, please do reach out. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm going to say with four minutes left, thank you very much for listening. Thanks for sticking around. I, we've had like a pretty high view rate, which I'm pretty, pretty proud of. So thank you very much for sticking around. It's been great. Um, what else do we have? So do we have any questions in the chat? Let's answer some questions. So I can probably now like remove myself from the screen. Let's remove this and let's go big screen. Look at you. Lucky me. I'm, I'm on the big screen. Right. Um, okay. So I'm going to move this one over this so I'm actually looking at the camera. What do we have? I've been very split about focusing more on Python or Go, getting into more automation workflows. Tough decision at times, often depends on your environment uh, and team and sport. Absolutely. Like I said, I'm not bashing any languages. I'm merely just trying to show you how I approached Golang and how I've used it. So I got in through a CLI and I've always found web development really interesting. I totally suck at the front end. I really could make the most basic Craigslist looking uh, website and never touch it again and have like a really great back end, really efficient, really well running. Um, I just chose to do the back end through this. Uh, I also worked a lot with Jenkins uh, and some CI/CD pipelines. So I specialize in DevOps. So this is sort of also why I get into Go and why I sit with it. So Python is certainly amazing when it comes to scripting. Um, that's for sure. But when I've needed something which is sort of more platform agnostic, which I can sort of create and lift and shift to any other platform. It's much easier for me to use Go, right? Whip something up in Go, compile it into a binary and throw it onto the next machine, if that makes sense. Um, it's always pretty lightweight as well. So it's great for CI CD pipelines uh, if you're using GitHub Actions or Jenkins or Travis CI and things like that. Um, so it works lovely in containers as well. What else do we have? Semi-random. I thought I'd just install Go on my Ubuntu WSL instance via apt. For some reason, it's sticking with Go version 1.13.8. Any idea why they would be staying with an older version? Honestly, absolutely no idea why they'd be staying with version 1.13 because nothing to my knowledge really happened at that point. Like I said, the milestones were really 1.11 and 1.18. That was with the Go modules and with uh, the generics that were introduced. Um, however, feel free to ping me afterwards. And I would also love to find out the answer to that question. Um, maybe it just needs to be kicked or you may need to uninstall the older version, actually. That might be why. You may need to uninstall the old version um, of Go. That's tricky on Ubuntu. Um, that's very, very dev-centric. So um, anything else? Which online labs or React to in-person workshops, if any, can you recommend? Cool. So online labs, we have got a whole bunch of links. And I'm actually going to grab one up quickly because I forgot to um, post that one across. So we have something called Microsoft Learn. And Microsoft Learn is a dedicated platform to learning material. And on there, we do actually have a great learning uh, with Golang. So let me just try and dig it out. I completely forgot to get it up. Um, there's one. That's the first one. So that whilst I'm getting this, I'll also talk about the others. So we've got uh, Go by Example, which uh, there will be a link sent in the chat. That's a really good one that I always go to, and I can show you those in just a moment. Um, so let me just do learn Go on Microsoft Learn. Here we go, taking your first steps with Go. So I'm gonna remove the locale from this as well, so because I know you're all global, and I love it that you're all global. So let me throw in this one as well. So learn Microsoft training, uh, taking your first steps with Go. Hopefully that link should work, and it's this one here. Really, really awesome. So Microsoft Learn, taking your first steps with Go. You have got um, Go by example. Really, really cool. Really, really basic, um, just straight up code. You can't really go wrong with that one. I mean, it's intuitive when reading it, but it's actually quite difficult to follow. So it's kind of double-edged sword. You've got uh, Learn Go with Tess, a really, really fantastic guide, which was written a while ago. I think it was around the 1.14 mark for Go. 
Um, super, super good. I am a huge fan of TDD, so test-driven development at this point. Um, I always have tried to follow it as best I can, uh, and that's going red, amber, green. Red, amber, green, I'm going to follow up with this next week, but you make the test fail, so you create a test. You then write a bit of code, chunky, ridiculous code as much as you like, and then that's the amber stage because you just get enough to pass the test. And then the green is when you actually refactor the code and have it passing the test. So that's, um, that's another really good one. Okay. Ah, so, so many coming up on the screen. Right, Liam, can you recommend any Golang books prefer trees for someone uh, from a SysOps PowerShell background? Yes, GoPro. Um, there is a really, really good book. I'm not sure um, how much it costs. Uh, or ProGo. Go, GoPro? Not, yeah, ProGo. I always recommend this book. I absolutely love it. It was came out at the beginning of this year. Um, I'm not actually going to send a link through here because that would be sort of advertisement. I don't want to do that one. But if you Google ProGo book, and that is just P-R-O-G-O -O book. Um, there's a really, really good one. It's really recent. There's a lot of really good examples in there. Um, I followed that. Uh, second to that one, if you join the Go for Slack channel, so if you go on to the VS Code marketplace, like I showed you where that Go uh, extension is, there's an actual button on there, like the little GitHub things. Um, there's a Slack channel on there. Really, really good, useful information. It's a huge Slack channel. Um, so don't get too overwhelmed, but it's a really, really good place to go for material and asking questions around go is there anything else before we wrap up the stream because i know i'm two minutes over um but if there's nothing else um, i'm going to wait and see if something does pop up massive thank you to everybody who is watching still and i look forward to seeing you in two weeks time on the 9th of november i think it's the same time uh 5 p.m i believe double check our website but it's definitely on our meetup and i'll definitely be posting about it Please do get in contact with me if you uh, want to ask any questions. So my handle is Liam C. Hampton, as you can see at the bottom there. Um, feel free to ping me on uh, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, whatever you fancy. I'm always open for discussions. I absolutely love this topic. I'm really passionate about it. And um, yeah, thank you for sticking around. And I look forward to two weeks time. Thank you very much, everybody. And goodbye. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>